Hello friend and welcome to another herb review video. In this video we are going over the category herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. So these are herbs that are treating damp heat conditions. And so like always if you want to follow along with the slides those are available at the website tcmstudy.net. You can download the slides, take a practice test, and as always, these videos are brought to you by viewers like you. So thank you to those who support the website and support the channel. If you want to join them in their support, there's some links in the description below if you want to contribute. Other than that, let's go ahead and get started with herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. So for herbs that clear heat and dry dampness, we're still in this big category of herbs that clear heat. Uh, before we did herbs that drain fire, and then we did herbs that cool the blood, and now we're into herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. So we're talking about different types of heat. So here, these herbs obviously treat damp heat. So what does damp heat look like? Well, when you look in Bensky, he just gives us some examples of damp heat. We have things like diarrhea and dysentery. This diarrhea is probably going to be kind of sticky with a strong foul smell. Things with heat tend to have a strong smell. Urination problems like difficult or painful urination. If damp heat is blocking the smooth flow of urine, we can get difficult, urgent, painful, rough urination. We call this Lin syndrome in Chinese. Jaundice, basically you got the damp heat, your skin turns yellow. Actually jaundice, we can say there's a yin type and a yang type. Here we're talking about the yang type where it's more damp heat. So jaundice is another possibility. We can have skin problems like boils, furuncles, carbuncles, eczema. So damp heat on the skin. I'm not really sure why I put boils for uncles carbuncles. So boils, boils and, and carbuncles are the same thing. A boil is just a, a collection of pus, usually due to an, an infected hair follicle. But I'm pretty sure a boil is just the common word for carbuncle. And when you have a bunch of boils that kind of form together into one uh, super boil, that's called a furuncle. So kind of redundant there to say boils for uncles, carbuncles, but it sounds fun. So that's why I say it that way. But anyway, we have damp heat on the skin causing skin problems, vaginal discharge or leucorrhea. Again, here it's going to be thick, sticky, yellow with a strong foul smell because we're dealing with damp heat. And this is this one is not actually in Bensky, but I wanted to add it in there because it came up in a formula recently. It's kind of a funny indication. Thirst with no desire to drink. And so the idea here is we have damp heat, and so the heat is causing thirst, but because there's dampness in the middle, you actually don't want to take in any more fluid. So you're thirsty from the heat, but the dampness is making you not want to drink, so you end up with thirst with no desire to drink. So that's kind of a, a funny one there that we can add in there. So these are just some examples of damp heat. It turns out Bensky just has one paragraph that lists them all out. But actually what I like better is if we go to this book by Nigel Weissman, uh, I should say Weissman and Brand, uh, Eric Brand, he goes into a little bit more detail about how damp heat is affecting the various organ systems and kind of gives a little bit more explanation as to why these symptoms occur. So I feel like Weissman and Brand, their book has a little bit better explanation of pathomechanism and things like that. Uh, the, it's, a, it's a concise materia medica, so their herb descriptions are only like one page long. It's much shorter than Bensky. But it's really nice because at the beginning of the chapter, they go into a lot of explanation about what's going on, the pathodynamic, pathomechanism, and it has a lot of Nigel Weissman terminology, which I actually really like. But anyway, so if we look at, if we instead look at it as what happens when damp heat affects a certain system, maybe we, the, these will make a little bit more sense. So we can have damp heat obstructing the middle jowl. So things like abdominal fullness, nausea, vomiting, poor appetite. Basically, when we say the middle jowl, we're talking about the spleen and the stomach. The spleen has an ascending function, the stomach has a descending function, and we get this damp heat in there gunking things up. It interferes with this ascending and descending function of the middle jowl. So we feel like 
fullness there because things are stuck, nausea, vomiting because things are going uh, back upwards, and poor appetite or lack of interest in food because you got that dampness just sitting there. Like you just ate a pan full of brownies and you're like, Ugh, I don't want to eat anything. We can have damp heat pouring downward into the large intestine. And so here's where we get diarrhea. And again, because this is damp heat diarrhea, it's going to be more like sticky, uh, foul smelling. Heat tends to have a foul smell. And um, so remember when we had like spleen chi deficiency, we talk about loose stools or watery stools or and that tends to not have a foul smell. Well, with damp heat, think about dampness is like stickiness. This damp heat is causing things to be sticky, has a strong foul smell, and we get diarrhea with ungratifying defecation. Which I just wanted to put that in there because I thought it was funny. Like ungratifying defecation. Have your patient come in saying like, ugh dealing with ungratifying defecation. It's like you, you went on a, a date and it's like, hmm, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. But anyway, that's, that's uh, when you say ungratifying defecation, it means the, the bowel movement feels incomplete. Because again, we're dealing with damp heat. Things are sticky. It's like you tried to get it all out and it didn't all come out. Like there's still more in there. You still got to go. So diarrhea with ungratifying defecation. Dysentery. What is dysentery? Uh, dysentery is like really bad diarrhea, usually due to an infection, and there might be some blood or pus in the stool. We have tenesmus. What is tenesmus? I think I went ahead and looked this up. So you have tenesmus is a continual or recurrent inclination to evacuate the bowels caused by a disorder of the rectum or other illness. So continuous inclination. It means like you always got to go. Or sometimes I think it's described as you have a bowel movement, then you immediately feel like you have to go again. So that's what we mean by tenesmus. And I think that's something that we talked about when we talked about uh, fong fong. Uh, if you remember back to warm acrid release the exterior, we talked about tenesmus. And sorry, I edited this slide and I forgot to move my emojis but that should say blood and pus in the stool. So again, when we have this dysentery, uh, it's an infection of the, in the large intestine and we have really bad diarrhea, possibly with blood and pus in the stool. In Chinese, sometimes they use the term red and white dysentery. When we say red and white dysentery, the red means there's blood in the stool, the white means there's pus. So when we have damp heat pouring downward into the large intestine, these are the things that we're going to see, that it's obstructing the movement. Normally, the large intestine is responsible for conducting the stool out of the body. But when you get this damp heat in there, it makes things uh, sluggish. So we have ungratifying defecation is the fun one there. We can have damp heat uh, obstructing the liver and gallbladder. So one thing we see commonly is ribside pain or fullness in the chest and hypochondria is what uh, Bensky likes to say. And so this is just the liver and gallbladder channels go across the rib sides. So if there's damp heat obstructing the free flow of chi through the channels, remember the liver is responsible for governing free coursing. So if damp heat is obstructing that free coursing, we can get ribside pain. We can also have jaundice and the idea here is the gallbladder is supposed to contain the bile and like keep it stored but if we have a lot of heat in that system the bile kind of spills over into the skin and that's jaundice so that's how we explain jaundice we usually attribute that to damp heat in the liver gallbladder we can have damp heat pouring down into the lower jowl. And when we say the lower jowl, we have a couple possibilities here. We can, again, have damp heat pouring down into the urinary bladder. And so when that damp heat obstructs the smooth flow of urine, we get painful, rough urination. And again, that's called Lynn syndrome. So damp heat in the UB or urinary bladder will cause urination problems. If that damp heat goes into the dimi, we can have vaginal discharge uh, or leucorrhea. And again, here, because we're dealing with damp heat, that's going to be vaginal discharge that's thick, sticky, yellow, and has a strong foul odor. So that's another thing that we have to differentiate, that damp heat tends to make things thick and sticky, and the heat causes a foul smell. 
And we can also have genital itch. You can think about this as the lower jowl. We can also think about the liver, the liver channel goes around the genitals. So when you get that damp heat collecting on the skin, you can get genital itch. Uh, maybe you can think about some uh, football players that are always like scratching their crotch. It's because they got the, that jock strap. It's, it's getting real hot and sweaty down there. So they have some damp heat accumulating on the skin in that area. We can have damp heat pouring into the joints. And so that damp heat in the joints is going to cause redness, swelling, and pain in the joints. And we call this B syndrome, painful obstruction syndrome. So damp heat in the joints can cause hot B. And we can have damp heat collecting on the skin for things like eczema or damp sores. And again, this is going to be... Mm, some itchiness is a possibility. And again, this is going to be things that because it's damp heat, we might see sores with pus and it's going to be that thick, yellow, sticky, foul smelling pus. Not, not like clear, thin fluids, but uh, that thick, sticky, foul smelling. And also you can think about um, skin problems because it's damp heat. The skin is going to be moist and itchy. So not not necessarily like dry and scaly like psoriasis, but more like damp, itchy things would be damp heat in the skin. So those are some of our possibilities. Those are some of the th symptoms we're going to be looking for when you use herbs from this category, herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. And this kind of just breaks it down a little bit. You can think about what is the normal function of these symptoms and what's going to happen when damp heat starts obstructing it. Remember, dampness is thick, sticky, it's sluggish, it tends to slow things down. So it's going to be slowing down all these processes or obstructing the free flow in here. And then we have heat on top of it. So that's how you can think of damp heat. When you look at the tongue, the tongue is going to have a thick, yellow, greasy coat because it's damp heat. And the pulse is going to be rapid because of the heat and then slippery or soggy because of the dampness. So it turns out that this damp heat can be very difficult to treat because, you know, dampness is a yin pathogen, but heat is a yang pathogen. And so the dampness is, uh, it's yin, it's uh, thick, sticky, it slows things down, it makes you feel heavy and sluggish. But the heat is yang, it speeds things up, makes you really active, dries things out. And so it's weird when you have a combination of these two things. It's hard to treat because normally to treat the dampness, we would use warm herbs to dry it out. Well, that's just going to make the heat worse. And if we were going to treat heat conditions, we would use cold herbs to cool down the heat. Well, that's just going to make the dampness worse. So what do we do? Well, luckily, we have this category of herbs, uh, herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. So this can take care of both the heat and the dampness at the same time. So when we look at the herbs, this is a pretty short category. We only have six herbs here, starting with the three huangs. So this is what we're looking at for herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. Before we get into that, let's look at the properties of this category as a whole. So the taste of these herbs is, of course, going to be bitter. Remember what we said about the bitter flavor? The bitter flavor does a couple things. The two main ones are it clears heat and drains fire, and it dries dampness. Well, here we're dealing with heat and we're dealing with dampness. So you can bet these herbs are going to be bitter in flavor. Kind of a little side rant. I had a, a Chinese teacher who was always very um, particular about this. He would often ask people, what does the bitter flavor do? And always the students would say the bitter flavor drains dampness. And he would say, no, the bitter flavor does not drain dampness. The bitter flavor dries dampness. When we talk about draining dampness, we're implying that they're promoting urination, and that's an action of the bland flavor. So he said a lot of people get confused that uh, the bitter flavor clears heat, and we just use a Chinese term, clear heat, drain fire, qing zhe xie hu, but we say draining fire, that's not the same as draining dampness. We're drying the dampness as the dampness just dries out. We're not promoting urination, we're drying it out. So that's just a little bit of a nitpicky thing. But so these herbs are definitely going to be bitter in flavor. The temperature is, of course, going to be cold because these herbs clear heat. They're going to be 
cold in temperature, like everything in this category. What's the entering channels? Eh, we really don't know. It kind of depends, because remember, we had damp heat. There were possibilities in all those different systems. We could have damp heat in the middle jowl, damp heat in the lower jowl, damp heat in the liver gallbladder, damp heat in the spleen stomach. So it really depends on where we're clearing the damp heat from. That's going to tell us what channels these herbs, en these herbs enter. So it's really going to depend. Cautions and contraindications, like everyone in this category, herbs that clear heat, we have to be careful that these herbs are very cold and bitter, and they may damage the spleen, because the spleen has an aversion to cold. So be careful with the, the usage of these. One, you want to make sure that your patient is strong enough to handle them, that they have a good spleen, and you also need to make sure you don't use them too long term. That long term use could eventually wear down the spleen. And this is actually maybe kind of important because, again, we are dealing with things like diarrhea and we are doing things like vaginal discharge. And so we really have to be sure that we're dealing with damp heat because it's very common to have diarrhea due to spleen chi deficiency. So if you give a person these herbs, you're going to make them worse. It's very common to have vaginal discharge leucorrhea due to spleen chi deficiency or due to cold, due to cold damp. And if you give them these cold bitter herbs, you're going to make the situation worse. So you need to make sure that we're actually dealing with a damp heat condition. So we need to look at those other signs and symptoms, not just this herb treats diarrhea. I'm going to give them the diarrhea herb. There's a possibility you might make the situation worse. So these herbs clear heat and dry dampness, and the things we're talking about are diarrhea, dysentery, loose stools, uh, urination problems because damp heat is blocking the smooth flow of urine, jaundice because that damp heat in the gallbladder is causing the bile to overflow and now your skin turns yellow, and certain skin problems like carbuncles, sores, boils, itchy skin, eczema, itchy genitals. And then we can say uh, these herbs are often combined with herbs that drain fire, or herbs that re uh, clear heat and resolve toxicity, which is which was the previous category and the next category. So these herbs that clear damp heat, we often combine them with other heat clearing herbs is basically what we're saying here. And actually later we're going to get into a category called herbs that drain dampness. And there's a subsection of that category that also deals with damp heat but those are more clearing the damp heat through the urine. So those are more dealing with urination problems specifically. Here we're talking about damp heat all over the place. So if we get into our herbs, our first herbs, um, maybe we should say at first, uh, our first set of herbs are the three huangs. So the first three herbs we're dealing with all have huang in the name. Huang means yellow, so we call them the three yellows. And uh, when you look at the herbs, they are in fact yellow. So we're starting with Huang Qin Scutellaria Radix. Huang Qin Scutellaria Radix. Uh, Huang Qin. Huang Qin is skullcap root. And so Huang Qin, uh, when we look at the individual functions, like everything in this category, Huang Qin clears heat and dries dampness. So it deals with conditions of damp heat. But what we want to know is, what's its specialty? What's it good for in terms of clearing damp heat? And actually its specialty is, it's kind of general. It does a lot of damp heat. So we can say damp heat in the stomach and large intestine causing diarrhea. Again, that diarrhea with ungratifying defecation or diarrhea that's sticky and has a strong foul smell. Um, so damp heat diarrhea. Also for damp heat in the lower jaw, specifically urination problems. So we might see this come up in things for like Lynn syndrome. But it turns out besides clearing just damp heat, it also clears heat in general. So we say it clears heat and resolves toxicity. So clears heat and heat toxicity. Again, clearing heat from a lot of different places. It clears lung heat. So fever with thirst, irritability, cough with thick yellow sputum. So when that heat gets into the lung, it cooks down the fluids in the lung. So we get phlegm that's thick, sticky, and difficult to expectorate. So we can use Huang Qin to clear that lung heat and help with that. You can also say it clears liver heat uh, for headache, irritability, red eyes, bitter taste in mouth. So liver heat, liver yang rising. And yes, this is true. It does do that. And I can think of some examples, but I really probably should have said clears liver and gallbladder heat just so I could include that Huang Qin is also very useful for treating 
Shaoyang disorders. So if you remember in our cool acrid herbs that released the exterior, we talked about the Shanghan Lun and we talked about Shaoyang disorders with Chai Hu, Chai Hu Bu Pluriradix. This was alternating fever and chills, bitter taste in the mouth, nausea, uh, fullness and distension in the chest and hypochondria. And so we said Chai Hu was our main herb for treating Shaoyang syndrome. Well, it turns out when we want to treat Shaoyang syndrome, we also pair it with this herb that's not on the screen right now, Huang Qin. And so this is a this is a common Duayao pair for treating Shaoyang syndrome, Chai Hu plus Huang Qin. And remember we said Shaoyang syndrome is a half exterior, half interior disorder. Well, Chai Hu is acrid and releases the exterior, so it takes care of the half exterior portion of Shaoyang. But Huang Qin is bitter and cold and it has a draining function. It drains the interior, so Huang Qin is taking care of the half interior portion of Shaoyang. Anyway, the point of this is when we say clear liver heat, uh, maybe cross that out and say resolves Shaoyang syndromes or at least add it in there that Huang Qin is very good for Shaoyang disorders as well. It can also be used topically, again, when we were talking about uh, stuff on the skin, uh, hot sores and boils, carbuncles, boils, furuncles. Uh, it can also be used for that. We can also say Huang Qin cools the blood to stop bleeding. So again, when we have heat in the blood, it can cause bleeding because the blood is speeding up so much. It begins to move frenetically or recklessly outside of the vessel. So by cooling the blood, we can stop bleeding. And then also we can say that Huang Qin, this is a very important one, calms restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. Have we talked about this before? Yeah, I think we did talk about this before when we talked about uh, Zutsu Ye. That was our example, that was our first example of an herb that calms restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. Zutsu Ye, perillifolium. There we said that one, it has an action of regulating the middle jowl or moving middle jowl chi. And so by moving it, it can help calm restless fetus. And what we said there is when you say restless fetus, we're talking about um, like excessive movements or excessive kicking of the fetus during pregnancy. And our fear there is when we have this excessive movement, that could be a sign of that there's a miscarriage that's about to happen. And so that's here we're treating restless fetus due to heat. So just like heat, like everything, heat causes things to speed up. Heat causes movement. When you get heat in the blood, the blood speeds up. Well, when you get heat in the womb, it causes the fetus to speed up. The fetus gets hot and bothered and starts moving around and we begin to worry about a miscarriage. So Huang Qin has this action of calming restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. So, so far, this is the second herb we've learned that has this function of calming restless fetus. And this one, we really need to pay attention to. Because if you remember back when we talked about Zutsu Ye, I said, mm, maybe this is a little bit controversial. I'm not sure that Zutsu Ye actually has this function. And to be fair, in, in Bensky, it's it's kind of like there's just one sentence at the very end. They're like, oh, yeah, it also calms restless fetus. With Huang Qin, we can definitely say it calms restless fetus. With Huang Qin, it's its own separate function. It's its own separate bullet point that, yes, it calms restless fetus. And this comes up in formulas like Taishan Panchersan, uh, bedrock powder. So Huang Qin also calms restless fetus. So when we look at these, if you're like, this seems really generic, like this is clearing heat from everywhere. That's kind of true. It is kind of clearing heat from everywhere. We're clearing heat in the stomach and large intestine. We're clearing heat in the lower jowl. We're clearing lung heat. We're clearing liver heat. We're cooling the blood to stop bleeding. So yeah, I would say Huang Qin is, uh, we use it a lot as an auxiliary herb for just clearing heat. So you're going to see it come up a lot because it clears heat from all these different areas. But we would say if we want to say there's a specialty of Huang Qin, some place that it really stands out, it would be that it clears lung heat. So fever, thirst, irritability, cough with thick yellow sputum. So it clears heat from the lung. That would be the specialty of Huang Qin. Uh, when we look at the taste and temperature, it's cold and bitter because we're dealing with damp heat. So obviously it's cold and bitter. 
lung, stomach, gallbladder, large intestine. We're clearing heat from all of those areas. Dosage is normal, three to nine grams. So that's Huang Qin, Scutellaria radix, or skull cap root. Uh, of the three Huangs you talk about, Huang Qin is the weakest, but it's also, I think, the most all-purpose. We tend to use it a lot just because it can clear heat from a lot of different areas. So that is Huang Qin, Scutellaria radix. Our next of the three Huangs is Huang Lian, Coptitis rhizoma. Huang Lian, Coptitis rhizoma is Coptis root. So Huang Lian, Coptis root. This one of the three Huangs, this is the strongest one. And of the three Huangs, I would say this is the most bitter tasting of them. So if you ever wanna know what the bitter flavor tastes like, get some Huang Lian. So like everything in this category, when we look at the examples, it clears heat and dries dampness. And this one is specifically good for damp heat in the stomach and large intestine. It's specifically good for diarrhea and dysentery. Whenever we talk about middle jiao damp heat, it's very common that we're gonna use Huang Lian. Whenever we're dealing with diarrhea dysentery, it's very common to use Huang Lian. Sometimes you would even say that if you're going to a, a foreign country and you're worried that the food is not so clean, sometimes people eat some bad food and they end up with dysentery, we'll say, oh, take Huang Lian as a pill and that will help with the dysentery. So it's, it's very strong, has a very strong action of treating diarrhea and dysentery, and we should definitely point this out as the specialty of Huang Lian is middle jowl damp heat and diarrhea. But like our others here, besides just clearing damp heat, it also just clears heat in general. So we can say clears heat and resolves toxicity. And so this is the one that a lot of people forget about. This also has an action of clearing heart heat. And this is something that's gonna come up in some of our formulas that clear heart heat. So. I think we talked about this when we, in our other category, drain fire, the common symptoms of heart heat, irritability, delirium, disorientation. These are all examples of Shen disturbance due to heat entering the heart. Look at that, it also clears stomach heat for things like nausea, acid reflux. You got this heat in the stomach and things start rebelling back upwards. So it not only clears damp heat from the middle jowl, it also just clears regular heat from the middle jowl. Also treats skin, crop, skin problems, boils, carbuncles, sores, boils, abscesses, furuncles, treats those damp heat skin problems. And like a lot in this category, it also cools the blood to stop bleeding. This is probably gonna be especially useful if we have blood in the stool. When we have that dysentery and there's bleeding dysentery, Huang Lian's probably gonna be very useful for that. Um, so like we said, Huang Lian is one of the most, mm, of the three Huangs, it's definitely the strongest. It's definitely the coldest and the most bitter. And even if you want to just taste Huang Lian, it tastes very bitter. It's very yellow and very bitter. Uh, what, I had a Chinese friend who would say that um, there's an expression that if you have a person who's uh, always downcast, very pessimistic, they always find something wrong with everything, you would say to them, oh, it's like you're playing a violin made out of Huang Lian, because that's, that's how bitter Huang Lian is. Um, don't quote me on this. I might be wrong about this. I might be thinking of something else, but I do believe Huang Lian is one of those that it's so bitter, it can actually come through uh, in the breast milk. So we, we might have to be careful about uh, breastfeeding mothers, that if they take some Huang Lian, that bitterness might come out in the breast milk and the baby won't like it. On the other hand, I think this is sometimes used as a strategy when you want to, when the baby wants to keep breastfeeding and you want to wean them off, you can use some Huang Lian and they'll taste the bitterness and be like, ugh, never mind. Um, kind of not sure if that's like you're supposed to take it internally or you're supposed to like rub some externally on your nipple. So um, maybe somebody try that and get back to me. Rub some, take some Huang Lian and rub it on your nipples and see what happens. But, but the point here is Huang Lian is, is a very cold, very bitter. I would say this is one of the coldest herbs we have. It's between Huang Lian and Shi Gao. These two are the two coldest herbs we have in our Materia Medica. So when we look at the taste and temperature, of course it's cold and bitter like everything in this category. We can, the channel should make sense. Uh, enters the heart channel because it clears heart heat. Enters the large intestine and stomach channel because we're dealing with middle jowl damp heat, diarrhea, dysentery 
and enters the liver channel because we're stopping bleeding. So all of those entering channels could, should make sense. Again, that's Huang Lian, Coptis rhizoma. Think about middle jiao damp heat for Huang Lian, Coptis rhizoma. And third of our three Huangs is Huang Bai Philodendry cortex. Huang Bai Philodendrum bark. So Huang Bai of our three uh, three Huangs, uh, like everything in this category, it treats damp heat. But Huang Bai here, its specialty is it's good for damp heat in the lower jiao. So think about. Um, Leucorrhea, vaginal discharge, when that damp heat goes downward into the lower jowl, we can get that vaginal discharge that's going to be thick, sticky, yellow with a strong, foul smell. Diarrhea, we can also kind of consider a lower jowl issue. I don't know, that's just what we say. Uh, pain in the knees, I think, is kind of interesting. It's like when this damp heat goes downward, it doesn't necessarily stop at the lower jowl. It might go all the way down to the knees, and we get that damp heat in the knees, so that damp heat obstructing the joints, causing that B syndrome. So when you talk about damp heat pouring downwards, it doesn't just necessarily pour down into the genitals and stop there. It can keep pouring down and go into the knees, so that's kind of interesting. The other really important thing about Huang Bai is that it clears deficiency heat as well. So for heat due to kidney yin deficiency. So if you remember, I think so far we've learned two herbs like this that we say they clear both excess heat and deficiency heat. Our other one was Jermu Anamarena rhizoma, that it uh, clears lung and stomach heat, but also has an action of clearing heat from de deficiency. And now we have another one Huang Bai also clears heat from deficiency. And this is actually really important. And here's an example of why. Let's pull up my little whiteboard here. That when we're looking to uh, tonify yin, our main formula for tonifying liver and kidney yin is called Liu Wei Di Huang Wan. Liu Wei Di Huang Wan is six ingredient with Ramanya pill. Di Huang refers to Sheng Di Huang and Shu Di Huang that we learned. So Liu Wei Di Huang Wan, if we have a person just with yin deficiency, this is our main formula that we use is Liu Wei Di Huang Wan. Well, it turns out if we have someone with yin deficiency, but they also have a lot of signs of heat, and we not only want to tonify the yin, we also want to clear the heat. They got like, they got night sweats, they got hot flashes, their bones are steaming, they got steaming bone disorder, and they're like, we can't just tonify yin, that's going to take two months, so we need to also clear the heat. What we can do is we can modify this formula and it becomes Jirbai Di Huang Wan. Jirbai Di Huang Wan is the modification that clears heat. And so what's happening here is we're just adding two herbs. The jur refers to jermu, anamarena rhizoma, and the bai refers to huang bai, fellow dendry cortex that we learned here. So this is a very common formula that we use in the clinic. And so we definitely want to remember that these two herbs have an action of clearing deficiency heat. Jermu and Huang Bai are used together to clear heat due to yin deficiency. So that's Huang Bai, fellow dendry cortex. It clears heat and dries dampness, especially think lower jowl damp heat, and it also clears heat from deficiency. So definitely think about kidney UB and the lower jowl. So when we look at this uh, herb, it's cold and bitter, like everything here, but its entering channels are kidney and UB because these are this is the pair that governs the lower jowl, or, or we could think of um, damp heat obstructing the urinary bladder, causing urination problems. That's why it enters the UB. And we can think about heat due to kidney yin deficiency. That's why it enters the kidney channel. Or we can just think, Huang Bai, lower jowl, kidney and UB are in the lower jowl. So that's Huang Bai, thelodendry cortex. So when we look at these herbs, we these first three, they all have Huang in the name, and so we refer to them as the three Huangs, or the three yellows. Huang means yellow, and it's because the herbs are yellow in color, like when you look at your sample. 
So a lot of times we can kind of come up this way with to kind of remember the three Huang. So here I have Huang Qin, Huang Lian, Huang Ba. That's the way we learn them. It's also very conveniently in reverse alphabetical order. So QLB goes in uh, reverse alphabetical order. Also very conveniently is they're each a different plant part. So Huang Qin is a radix. Huang Lian is a rhizoma, and Huang Bai is a cortex. So maybe that can help you remember the Latin names of Scutellaria radix, Coptitis rhizoma, and Philodendri cortex. But anyway, we often talk about them, these three in this way, because we say their specialty corresponds to one of the three burners, or one of the three jiao. So we say Huang Qin, its specialty is for treating heat in the upper jiao. When we say heat in the upper jiao, we're talking about the lung. So again, when that heat enters the lung, it obstructs the flow of qi, so we get cough, but it also cooks down the fluids and gives us a thick, yellow, sticky, difficult to expectorate sputum. So Huang Qin, its specialty is that it clears heat from the lung. Huang Lian is good for the middle jiao. Huang Lian's specialty is that it clears both heat and damp heat from the middle jiao. And so you can think about spleen stomach, stomach heat. You can think about the spleen and diarrhea. Huang Lian is really good for diarrhea and middle jiao heat. Huang Bai, like we said, is good for the lower jiao. So things like leucorrhea, vaginal discharge, urination problems. So this is a, a this is a very kind of straightforward way to remember the three Huangs is each of the three Huangs goes to one of the three burners or one of the three jiaos. But we should probably be careful not to stop there because sometimes people remember this and that's all they remember. And it turns out there's a lot more going on. So we, so we still have to remember other things about these herbs. That Huang Qin, yes, its specialty is clearing heat from the upper jiao, but like we said, it kind of clears heat from everywhere. It clears that liver gallbladder heat. It's good for Shaoyang syndrome. It cools the blood. Um, it can be used for heat in the stomach as well. So it also clears heat from these other areas as well. And also we need to remember that it clears heat to calm restless fetus. So that's another important thing about Huang Qin. Don't just remember upper jiao. We need to remember those other things. With Huang Lian, yes, Huang Lian clears heat and damp heat from the middle jiao. But the one that people tend to forget is Huang Lian also clears heart heat as well. And the heart isn't really in the middle jiao, so it doesn't quite fit so well with this. But we are going to see formulas. When we start going through formulas, we are going to see formulas where Huang Lian is an ingredient and it's there because it clears heart heat. So definitely its specialty is middle jiao, but also think about heart heat for Huang Lian. Huang Bai, I mean, it clears lower jiao heat and that's kind of what it does. Just remember it also clears deficiency heat. And again, maybe you can think about lower jiao and you can think about the kidney as in the lower jiao and that can remind you that it also clears heat due to deficiency. So these are the three Huangs, the three yellows, and they're three of our major herbs for treating both heat and damp heat. And we're going to see them come up a lot in formula class, so you definitely need to know these three formulas, the three Huangs. After that, our next one is Long Dan Sao Gentianai Radix. Long Dan Sao Gentianai Radix. Long Dan Sao. Oh, sorry, when we have three, I, I get confused. When we have three third tones in a row, uh, the first one becomes second tone. So we say Long Dan Sao. So Long Dan Sao. Um, this one, like everything, it clears heat and dries dampness. This one is definitely its specialty, is that it clears damp heat from the liver and gallbladder. So for things like jaundice, again, we said that jaundice is the liver and gallbladder. The liver produces the bile, the gallbladder stores the bile. If there's heat in that system, the bile can spill over into the skin and give us jaundice. Leucorrhea and genital itching, yeah, technically I should say that Long Don Sao clears lower jiao damp heat and because it treats vaginal discharge and genital itching. But really the way I think about this is if you remember your points class when you talked about the liver channel, the liver channel goes to the genitals. Actually all of the liver channels. The, the liver primary channel, the liver divergent channel, the liver luo channel, they all wrap around the genitals. So when we have these genital problems, 
I think we can just attribute that to the liver. So that's, I just say, clears heat, clears damp heat from the liver and gallbladder. And we can think about vaginal discharge and genital itching being in there. I also wrote herpes on there. Honestly, that's not from the book. There's not a textbook that says specifically Long Don Sao treats herpes. M maybe the Chen and Chen book does. I would have to look. But really, I just think of this as like, this is just my way of remembering it. I think of this as the, the herpes herb. So genital damp heat in the liver, uh, the liver channel is usually how we diagnose herpes. So think about like, those are the type of skin problems that we're talking about, that we have these pustules with fluid, it's itchy, the, the genitals are a very damp, warm place. And it's also, it's kind of funny because when I say the liver channel goes to the, when you talk about the pathway of the liver channel, it encircles the genitals, but then it also goes up and there's a branch that encircles the lips. So a lot of people will be like, the liver channel goes to the lips. And I'm like, that means two things. So when we have this damp heat in the liver gallbladder, this could be HSV1 or HSV2 because the liver channel goes to both of those areas. So that's just the way I remember that. And I think that would be an example of when you talk about genital itching. That's one example is um, an HSV infection. Besides clearing damp heat from the liver gallbladder, it also clears just heat from the liver gallbladder. So headache, red eyes, flank pain, I want to say flank pain is a Nigel Weissman thing, or we might say uh, fullness and distent distension in the, the rib sides or hypochondria. But again, this is liver heat or liver yang rising. So long down cell, we definitely need to know that it clears both heat and damp heat from the liver gallbladder channels. And then just remember where the liver gallbladder channels go. Uh, goes up to the vertex, so you get headache. Go, it's associated with the eye, so you get eye pain. It goes to the rib side, so you get rib side pain. It goes to the genitals, so you get genital issues. So we even see this in the taste and temperature. It's cold and bitter, like everything here, and it's entering channels, very obviously, liver and gallbladder. So the name is actually interesting here. Long Don Sao, Long means dragon. Don means gallbladder, and sao means herb. Yeah, gan means liver, don means gallbladder. So this is dragon gallbladder herb. And so gallbladder is in the name of this herb, so you know it's good for gallbladder heat. So that one, the name is actually useful. Long means dragon, like um, in Kung Fu Panda, the first one, the main villain was Tai Long, so great dragon. Uh, long means dragon. I'm trying to think of some other examples. We have a formula called Shaoqing Long Tong, minor blue green dragon decoction. Uh, Bruce Lee had the nickname Xiao Long, little dragon. So long means dragon, don means gallbladder. If you can remember that don means gallbladder, this herb is good for heat and damp heat in the liver and gallbladder. So that's Long Don Sao, Jintianai Radix. Next is Ku Shen, Sephari flavicentis radix. Ku Shen, Ku Shen, Ku Shen, Sephari flavicentis radix. So Ku Shen, like everything in this category, it clears heat and dries dampness, so it treats damp heat conditions. And again, this one we could say its specialty is damp heat in the lower jowl. I think specifically, um, here we say jaundice and diarrhea. I tend to think specifically of sores and vaginal discharge. So that's Ku Shen, especially for that. And maybe the reason I think that is because of the second action here as we say it kills parasites and stops itching. So it's good for fungal infections, genital itching. So that's why I think of genitals, athlete's foot, another fungal infection. We can use it internally or externally as a wash. And so maybe the way, the reason I think of this is, uh, I had a, a, one of my herb teachers made some comment about sometimes this was used prophylactically by um, uh, like geishas or uh, prostitutes. So they would like use this as a preventative measure to make sure that nothing happened to their genitals, that they didn't end up with any sort of genital itch from all the damp heat that was going on down there. So maybe that's why I remember this action. 
But we probably should point out here, when we say kill parasites, this might be the first herb so far where we've had this come up where we say it kills parasites and stops itching. It turns out in TCM when we say kills parasites or when we talk about parasites, we can mean two things. We can mean real parasites like roundworm, pinworm, tapeworm, hookworm, real parasites that are actually like bugs in your body. But also when we say parasites, we can mean certain skin infections. Usually we're talking about like fungus infections. So we, we use the word tinea. A lot of people ask, what is tinea? Well, tinea is like uh, athlete's foot is a type of tinea. It's a fungus infection, but you can also have athlete's foot in your armpit, but we can't call it athlete's foot because it's no longer your foot. It's your armpit. So we call it tinea, but it's the same kind of fungal infection. So this is something we're going to see, uh, see come up in a lot of our herbs that they have this action of killing parasites, but sometimes just don't get confused. Sometimes, yes, we mean real parasites like roundworms and pinworms, but sometimes we mean skin infection like athlete's foot, tinea, itchy genitals. And so that's what we're talking about here is uh, fungus infections, think again, athlete's foot, tinea, or genital itching. We can take it internally, so you cook it in decoction and drink it as a tea, or you can use it externally, as, you, as in you would cook a decoction and then use it as a soak or a wash. So if you had athlete's foot, you could just stick your entire foot in there and soak it. If you had it on other areas, you might um, dip a cloth in it and use it as a compress or wash the area to help with that itchy skin. But that's what we mean when we say kill parasites. One of the ways we can tell the difference is if we're talking about real parasites, we'll often say the action is the herb expels parasites. So if you say see expels parasites, we can be pretty sure we're talking about uh, intestinal parasites like roundworm, tapeworm. But if you see kills parasites, more likely we're talking about these type of skin things like fungus infections. So that's what we're talking about here is kills parasites. And also promotes urination for that rough, painful, dribbling urination when you have damp heat blocking the UB. This also promotes urination. So we got a lot of lower jowl stuff here. So think Kushen is good for the lower jowl. Uh, so one example of this uh, for Kushen is something, at least we always had in our clinic, something you might see commonly in clinic is this product called Yin Care. Yin care is kind of an, uh, uh, I guess, patent medicine would be the word. Uh, so we have this thing. Sorry, clicking my buttons. We have this, this product called Yin Care Herbal Wash. And so uh, this is something that you can use on the skin. It's I, I feel like it's most commonly used, again, for lower jowl problems. So for things like vaginal discharge, think about like yeast infections. In fact, it even, I think it shows one of the pictures here, it even comes with an internal applicator. I think that's what we're showing here. It has an internal applicator so you can use it as a douche in for lower jowl things. Um, what was the point? Where were we going with this? Oh, if we look at the ingredients, we can see uh, one of the ingredients over here is Kushen. It says Rx means radix, radix sephora. So Kushen is one of the ingredients in this yin care. So you can use it for like a yeast infections, a vaginal discharge, but you can actually also use it topically on the skin when you have other problems of damp heat other places on the skin. So don't think that this is only for yeast infections. This is good for all types of skin problems, but it's also good for lower jowl. And you can see there's some other herbs we learned there. So this one says Huang Bo, that's another name for Huang Bai. So Huang Bai Philodendri Cortex is there. Uh, Huang Qin Scutellaria Radix is there. And uh, there's some other ones we learned. Uh, Jirtza Gardenia Fructus is there. Remember Jirtza we learned in the drain fire category and that, that clears heat and damp heat. It guides it out through the urine. So Jirtza is another one. So that's just an example of using Ku Shen to clear damp heat especially for clearing damp heat from the skin. So damp heat causing itchy skin, or we could even say damp heat in the genitals. So that is Kushen, Sephora Flavicentis Radix. Again, it's bitter and cold like all of these. 
Yeah, that enters a lot of different channels. I wouldn't worry about that's all. That's too many channels. Don't worry about that. Just remember, ku shen is good for the lower jiao. Uh, ku shen, the word ku actually means bitter. So when we talk about the five flavors, if you look, if you go back to our lecture on the five flavors and look at the Chinese names for the five flavors, ku means bitter. So xin means acrid, gan means sweet, ku means bitter, shen means root. So ku shen means bitter root. So that was always the way I remembered this one is ku shen means bitter root, ku means bitter. So obviously the bitter flavor clears heat and dries dampness. This herb is good for clearing heat and drying dampness. Then when I started teaching, uh, I remember I had one student who was like, uh, ku shen is good for your cooch. And I thought that was actually kind of clever. So ku shen, good for your cooch. Maybe that can help you remember that it's good for damp heat in the lower jaw. So that's Kushan Sephora Flavicentus Radix. And our last one is Qin Pi Fraxini Cortex. Qin Pi Fraxini Cortex. So Qin Pi. And again, remember when we, uh, I think in the intro, we talked about different types of plant parts. Um, maybe we didn't talk about it, but I have a slide in one of my handouts about the different names for the different types of plant parts. And the word Pi means literally means skin. So when we talk about the lung governs the skin and the body hair, the word for skin is pea. But for plants, it just means the skin of the plant. So it can mean the peel, like tangerine peel, or it can mean the bark, or it can mean the outer layer, like we talked about shengjiang pea, the peel of ginger. Well, here pea means skin as in bark. So this is qin pea. It's a cortex. It's fraxini cortex. It's a type of bark. And so like everything here, it clears heat and dries dampness. This one is its specialty is diarrhea and dysentery. So Qin Pi is good for diarrhea and dysentery. In fact, um, we have all these other things here. Clears liver heat too bright and nice. Yeah, I guess it kind of does that. Treats hot bee syndrome. Yeah, I can kind of think of maybe uh, one or two formulas that does that. Stops coughing and wheezing. Yeah, really its specialty is Qin Pi clears uh, clears heat and dries dampness to treat diarrhea. So for Qin Pi, I would definitely think of diarrhea and dysentery. And this one is kind of interesting. Uh, actually, some books put this herb in the category clear heat toxicity. So that's the category we're gonna talk about next is the heat toxicity category. Fenske puts it in the damp heat category. Um, some other books put it in the heat toxicity category where we have other herbs that deal with diarrhea and dysentery. But our most famous one is Baito Wong, but we tend to pair it with Qin Pi as well for treating diarrhea and dysentery. Here's kind of the interesting thing about Qin Pi is like everything here, it's cold and bitter because it clears heat and it's bitter because it clears heat and dries dampness. But we also say it's astringent in nature as it, in, as it holds things in. So here we're actually treating the diarrhea in two ways. On the one hand, we're clearing the damp heat, we're clearing heat and drying dampness, but we're also inducing astringency to bind up the intestines and we're holding the diarrhea in that way as well. So this is kind of interesting that well, on the one hand, we're using the cold bitter flavor to get rid of the damp heat. That's like the root cause of the diarrhea. But then this also has an astringent action that binds up and treats kind of the branch symptoms of, of all the dysentery. So Qin Pi, I would definitely remember diarrhea and dysentery. So again, we got gallbladder, liver, stomach, enters the liver channel because it clears liver heat to brighten eyes. It enters um, the, gall the liver gallbladder channel, does those things. I would really remember damp heat, diarrhea, or dysentery. So that is Qin Pi, Fraxini Cortex. Let's go ahead and do a review. So we start off with the three Huangs, Huang Qin, Huang Lian, Huang Bai. And like we said, these three Huangs go to each of the three Jiao. So Huang Jin is good for the upper Jiao, good for heat in the lung. 
Huang Lian is good for the middle jiao. So think stomach heat or damp heat in the middle jiao. When we say damp heat in the middle jiao, you can think of diarrhea and dysentery. And Huang Bai is good for the lower jiao. So think about vaginal discharge, uh, leucorrhea. We even said like things going into the knees, itchy genitals. Uh, you can even get damp heat going on down into the knees. So Huang Bai lower jiao. But we also need to remember some other things about it. Huang Qin, its specialty is clearing lung heat, clearing heat from the upper jowl, but it clears heat from a lot of different areas. We also need to remember that it calms restless fetus. This is gonna be a very important function that, come, that likes to come up a lot. Huang Lian clears middle jowl damp heat, so it's good for heat in the stomach. It's also good for middle jowl damp heat causing diarrhea and dysentery, but it also clears heart heat as well. So certain types of Shen problems due to heat, we're gonna see that come up. Huang Bai, think lower jowl, it clears damp heat from the lower jowl, but it also clears heat due to deficiency. So Jiramu and Huang Bai are both good for clearing deficiency heat as well. Long Don Sao means dragon gallbladder herb. So Long Don Sao is good for heat in the liver and gallbladder. Here we mean both heat and damp heat in the liver gallbladder channels. And then just think about where those channels go. That the channel goes to the genitals, the channel goes to the rib sides, the channel goes to the eyes and the head. So you can get eye, red eyes and headache. And also think about jaundice, that the um, because the gallbladder stores bile, when that bile overflows, we get jaundice. So long down sao, heat and damp heat in the liver gallbladder. Ku shen is good for your cooch. It's good for lower jowl damp heat, and it's good for itching due to damp heat. So we said it kills parasites, but when we say kill parasites, we mean fungal infections, like athlete's foot or yeast infections. Qin pi, think diarrhea and dysentery. Qin pi is a very, that's, I think its specialty is diarrhea and dysentery. So those are our herbs that clear heat and dry dampness. Again, if you want to download these slides, those are available on the website. You can get them at tcmstudy.net. There, there's also going to be a practice test you can take as well. So if you go to tcmstudy.net, Click on the Herbology 1 tab. Here you'll find some, uh, there are slides. I'm in the process of making flashcards, so I'll have the flashcards up. And there's also a practice test you can take. So, oh, here, in clearing heat, what is Chin Pi's specialty? We just said it's good for diarrhea and dysentery. So it clears damp heat and it's also astringent to bind the intestines, so that's really convenient. Which of the following clears damp heat from the liver and gallbladder channels for things like jaundice, leucorrhea, genital itching, and also drains liver fire for things like headache, red eyes, and flank pain? Well, this is the dragon gallbladder. Uh, Long Down Sao has gallbladder in the name, so it's probably good for gallbladder heat. Uh, maybe another thing you can think of here is long means dragon. You can think that dragons are green, and green is the color of the liver. So that, that might be another one. Uh, really this has to do with um, when we talk about the five animals, it turns out each of the five phases has an animal associated with it and the dragon is associated with the wood phase. So maybe that's another way you can remember that uh, Long Don Sao dragon is for liver gallbladder. So. Uh, handouts and uh, practice tests are available on the website as well as everything, all the previous categories are up there as well. So if you want to review all of those categories in detail, those are up on the Herbology 1 section of the website. In these videos, we've been going over those channels or oh, we've been going over those herbs in very detail. These videos tend to be an hour long. So this, is, this could be very good review if you're studying for a quiz or a midterm, but if you're studying for finals, if you're studying for boards, if you're studying for year ends, and you want to quickly review all of the herbs, all 280 herbs, there is a review course on the website. So if you go over to resources and click review courses, there is a single herb review course that goes over all of the herbs, all 281 or 283 herbs, single herbs that we learned. And that just goes through a little bit more quickly. Instead of an in-depth discussion of each herb, it's kind of a quick review of all the herbs. And that one has its own 
handouts that uh, some cheat sheets that just very quickly list the functions. It also has some practice tests that are all of the herbs mixed together. So if you want to just review all of herbs, you can go to the single herb review course. If you're studying for if you're studying formulas, if you're studying for boards, especially for nationals in America, uh, you might prefer to go to the formula review course. This just goes over all the formulas on the NCCUM list. So that might be a little bit more helpful if you're studying for boards. When we go through these formulas, we also talk about some of the major functions of the individual herbs. So it's kind of a good way to go over both formulas and individual herbs and Dwei Yao pairs. So that's another one that um, it has videos for every category. It also has some practice tests with uh, uh, quite a few questions and it has some handouts that's just a one big cheat sheet for all of the formulas that are in the NCCM list. So if you need to review, that's another way you can do it. Or you can just uh, look on the website. There's a, there's a lot of stuff you can just get for free on the website. So there's a lot of single herb stuff. There There is a section on formulas where we do talk about some formulas there. So there's quite a bit on the website if you just wanna look at that stuff as well. But thank you for being here. Um, and like we said before, these videos are brought to you thanks to the support of viewers like you. So like we said, besides those review, review courses, there's a lot of free content on the website and on the YouTube channel. And it's because, uh, it's because of your support that, that those things are possible. So if you are getting value of this, out of this and you want to contribute, there are several ways you can do that. There are some links in the description below. One way is to join the Patreon. That's like a monthly pledge. So that's like the PBS model of supporting with a monthly pledge. Uh, if you want to just give a one-time donation, there's a buy me a coffee link that you can just uh, donate one time instead of having it be a recurring monthly thing like a cell phone bill. Uh, there's some merchandise on the website. There's some t-shirts, which I should probably start wearing in these videos. And uh, purchasing those review courses also helps keep things running. So we appreciate that. And when I say we, I mean me, because this is a one man show. So thank you for being here. Those are some ways you can support the website and we'll be back next week with the next category. So we'll see you then.